I'm going to give you our, our theme verse, and it's out of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And the Bible says this, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Turn your neighbor and say, nope, not your shoulders. They're on his. And his name. Underline this in your Bible. His name. There's no other name given among heaven or on earth by which men can be saved. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Somebody say amen. amen. So that first blank is for your title in your notes there today. I want you to write this down as the title of my message today. The truth in my reality. The truth in my reality. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, will you challenge us today? Holy Spirit, would you guide us today? I know some of us, Lord, are in places that we just can't seem to see you. So I pray, Lord, right now that every heart, every spirit would be turned to you. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Lead us to you. Lead us to a rock that is higher than us. We reach for you, Lord. We look to you. We honor you. And we thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen and amen. You know, I, I read that passage in, in Isaiah. And the Bible says that his name will be called. And if, you, if you've studied your Bible, and just to give you a little bit of context, you know, these are not the literal names of God but it's a description more, of, more so of his character. And if you want to know God's character, it can be attributed to all of these things. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. He's a mighty, mighty God. He's an everlasting father. He's a prince of peace. That's the character of your God. And the Bible reveals all of that. It's truth that is that is made known throughout all generations and generations that have previously come. That the goodness of God's name will be told to all of mankind, and that's what you and I embrace as truth. But sometimes in our way of living, we disconnect ourselves, or we find ourselves disconnected from what we know about God to what we actually see in our lives. They're two different things when they shouldn't be. What we know and what we experience are often different. What we know and, and, and read about, all the heroes of faith that we've seen throughout all of the Bible that have experienced the goodness of God, why is it that sometimes we can't connect ourselves to that? Our reality just seems different. And we have a tendency to elevate things that should not be elevated. And we have a tendency to go, yeah, but man, this is such a painful thing that we're, I'm going through right now. It's hard for me to connect God's goodness and God's character with my reality. Well, I want to challenge you to be able to find him today. That truth is not, is not, uh, it's not limited to your great experience. That truth still lives in the valley. There's still truth, and God is still good no matter what part of the world you're walking through. That you could walk into a church that as long as the Spirit of God is there, even if you don't understand the language that they're speaking, you can still know that the Holy Spirit is present. That even though you're walking and it feels like you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, that you could still experience God's goodness. Just because you can't feel him doesn't mean he's not there. And that disconnect, is, is, it happens to all of us, even people that have been to church for a long time. Sometimes church can be kind of mundane. Sometimes being in the presence of God through your eyes and through our eyes can be kind of, well, this is routine. Where are you really? And I want to challenge you that this would not just be any other Sunday. That we would, you would come every single time to a place of worship and not expect the same thing all the time. That God will go, no, 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 I'm going to do something a little bit different 
and your expectation to go, ooh, okay, let's go there then. Not just like, well, he, we, we found a cookie-cutter recipe for encountering the presence of God. No, he does things different. And even when you're going through the toughest of times, even when you're super, super tired, even when you feel fatigued and you don't want to go anymore, you could still see and still know that the character of God has not changed, that he truly is indeed wonderful. Somebody say amen. It's that disconnect with what you know him being as wonderful to what you're experiencing right now. Sometimes there's just heaviness that happens. And it's hard to embrace even though we know that he's still good when you can't experience his goodness in the moment. I want to share with you just from that thought. I want to, I want to lead you to lie down in green pastures today. So that you can lay there and go, ah, oh, he's so wonderful. Again, remember that time when you first experienced God? I, I remember a time in my life when I first knew that God was real and I first got saved. I wanted to go to church every day of the week. I'm like, gosh, I got to wait till Sunday again? Six days? Come on, there's got to be something. I find a Bible study. It's just not the same, you know. You want the big band. You want everything. <laughs> It'd be nice if Ryan and the girls would just come over every now and then. Just I'm just laying on the couch while y'all just worship. <laughs> It'd be nice. But the truth is that doesn't really happen. You have to find that space within here, inside of your heart. So I'm going to tell you today what to look for. Because when... When, when, when there's a disconnection between truth and your reality, what do you look for? I know that we look for Jesus. But how do you do that? Because sometimes if I just look generally, well, Jesus is supposed to be here and helping me. Sometimes my experience doesn't really translate as well as it should. Sometimes the weightiness of the moment will, will kind of have its weight of, of, of picking his head up and going, oh, no, no just stay heavy. When I don't want to be heavy anymore, right? I don't want you to be heavy anymore. I feel like this year has been kind of heavy, at least from this pastor's standpoint, looking out at, at what I'm shepherding. I know it's been heavy. It's tired. But I'm sitting, sitting here, and I've been praying all week, going, God, where are you? Because I really, really need to experience you right now. I feel like I look here. And I don't really experience you as, as much as I used to. I look over here, and I don't experience you as much as I used to right here. But God has challenged me to look at something different. I'm going to give you a place to look. One word, and it's in this word, grace. Grace. Most of us can't really embrace the magnitude of that word. But it's big. You and I can't even put it, we, 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 I think it's poorly attempted that we try to coin that term and put it and, and give a definition to it because that word of grace actually is so much bigger than what you and I could define in words. You and I will never know the magnitude of God's grace, ever. All I do know is that it came in the form of a person. Grace is a person. It's not a word. It's not a doctrine. It's not a theory. Grace is a person, and that person's name is Jesus. And the more and more that you can connect those two things and realize that I just need to find grace in this moment, you will find the Savior 100% of the time. When things are going really, really rough for me, and when it's not working out to my advantage in the way that I think that it should work out, the first thing that I need to look for is grace. God, I can't get through this. I need you. And guess who shows up? Grace. Jesus shows up. God, I'm so tired. I, just, I need just a little bit of energy right now because all my kids are sick and my wife is, is, is battling because she's nurse and I need to be able to be nurse when she's tired. Lord, help me. And guess who shows up? Grace. It's that unearned, unmerited favor that shows up randomly. But according to the kingdom of God, it doesn't show up randomly. It's right there when you need him. 
It's very specific. So if you have a problem connecting your truth or his truth to your reality, look no further than grace. That's what you grope after. That's what you reach for. That's what you don't ever let go of. There's no height, no depth, no length, no width that God can't come in, that his love can't reach you. That is grace. Even when you didn't deserve it, grace still showed up. Even when you're acting crazy and being disobedient and wayward, grace is still available. That is one of the most magnanimous concepts of God and character uh, of his character that I just can't even put into words it would be it would be insensitive me of me to try to coin this and speak to you and tell you what grace exactly is all I'm telling you right now is that it's big and it's bigger than what you and I can define and when you're going through a tough time and if you are reach for grace because that will get you through and then when you go I believe God moves you from grace to grace to grace, just as he does from glory to glory to glory. And when you need the truth in your reality, grace will be the bridge. In fact, in in the book of John, John chapter 1, I think it's verse 14, the Bible says that Moses came with the law, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when you're trying to connect truth, you need to connect it with the one that is grace and truth. Who is Jesus? And when you find truth, there will always be grace. When you find grace, there will always be truth. And that's what you need in your life. You need to experience grace because that's what makes you and enables you to give more grace. That when things are going rough and and you almost want to say to your kids, ah, suck it up. Be a man. Get through it. There's times where you just can't do that, but you need to give grace. You know, I, I, I'm at a point now, I'm actually coaching basketball. And you're probably sitting there going, that's kind of suicidal, Pastor. you got no time to be coaching basketball. And I sat there and I looked at myself, and I, I will only get my kids at 11 and 9 once. And I love basketball. <laughs> so what better way to go hang out with my kids than to coach them? So then I prayed. I said, God, if you don't want me to do this right now, if you're going to give me another time, that's okay. You know, I'll wait. But then I strongly felt in my spirit. It's like, no, do it now. And it's crazy right now. This is the busiest time of the year for all of us right now. October, November, December. We, it's almost like we don't get to take a breath until the end of the year. But then I felt, you know what? I'm going to put this on my plate. And then my, my wife goes, boy, you crazy. And I prayed and I said, God, will you make a way so that they're both on the same team? Because they're two, two, two different um, uh, uh, divisions, supposed to be. One's nine, one's 11. One's supposed to be in, in 10U, the other one's supposed to be in 12U. And so I'm sitting there going, if we could work it out, Lord, where they're both on the same team, then that means I only have to go to one practice, not two practices. I only have to go to one game, not two games. So I said, God, would you give me some grace right here, right now, so I can do this and be there for my children? And sure enough, they're on the same team. And even though it feels busy, I feel rested because I feel like I'm operating within the context of the rhythm that God wants me to operate in. It's good. I will never get my kids back at this age again. They're only nine once, and they're only 11 once. And I am learning. Praise God, I'm learning to give grace to 9-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds who don't know how to make a layup yet. It's the hardest thing. I almost feel like, can I just get a uniform, City of Henderson? Can you give a 47-year-old a uniform so he can go play with his team on the 12U League? It's hard to give grace sometimes, but because I've been given grace, I can give grace. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm going to show you a picture here of how the truth worked in somebody else's reality and and it's it's part of the christmas uh, theme story so you'll you'll be able to to relate and and it's it's about the shepherds finding out that jesus was born and it and it comes to you in luke 2 so you can write this down but we'll put it up on the screen for you luke 2 and verse 
8. So here's, here's what happens. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. I want you to pay attention to something because angels revealed to Mary and to Joseph that the, that the Savior was going to be born through them and to them. Angels revealed, uh, 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 the wise men were able to decipher and knew that the star was available and, and uh, thus knowing that the Christ was born. So they had something to pursue. And wise men pursue God. Somebody say amen to that. Wise men pursue Jesus. And if you would deem yourself to be wise, you know who you need to pursue. Not a degree, not a better job. You need to pursue the Savior. Somebody say amen. And so those people were all introduced to Jesus. But I want you to pay attention to who Jesus and who God did not leave out. And it was the shepherds. The people that were out working on the field. The people that, that from, a, from a social standpoint, they were at the lowest of the totem pole. They were the bottom feeders. Oh, you're, y'all just a bunch of shepherds. Why don't you go out in the field so that you're not around us all the time? Go over there and tend to your work. They were people that, that were not esteemed as scholarly. They weren't the brightest cats in the world. They were shepherds. Their brilliance and their capacity to be able to work was just to go lead some sheep around and sit and watch them eat. But I love this picture because it shows me so much about grace. That grace doesn't just come to the people that are involved, the Marys and the Joseph. Grace doesn't just come to those that are wise, the priests, the rabbis, the kings, all the who's who's. Grace comes to the ordinary. And before you sit there and wonder if you're worthy of grace, let the shepherds tell you, you are. Because if Jesus would show up and let the shepherds who are out just working, they were in the field doing their job. Probably looking at each other going, all right, Mo, here we go. It's just another night. You, me, and some sheep. Bye. Out in the field. Here we go, another 12 hours or so. Keep doing what we're doing. But there came an an interruption. The Bible says in the same region where shepherds, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Verse 9 says that an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. An angel shows up in the middle of their mundane circumstance. An angel shows up in the middle of what would be considered boring. Truth wants to interrupt your boring moments. Grace wants to interrupt things that are just mundane and ordinary to you because there's nothing ordinary about God. And it's not that they earned it. They weren't the best shepherds on the planet. God did not go, let me see, you know, why don't you write an essay and whoever can write the best essay, I'll show up to those guys. No. Angel just showed up. In fact, when grace shows up and when an interruption in your life that is divine happens, trust me, you will be filled with fear because you won't know how to act. Whenever God shows up, it's always like, oh, whoa, I wasn't ready for that. You know how many times I've prayed for God to move and I've asked God, God, will you please just do something? And then I would keep walking in my mind. I'd go, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then when God does something, I stop and I go, oh, I can't believe it. (laughs) Your response is never what you think that it would be. When when I prayed and I asked, Lord, I need another car. I I don't know how you can do this because we can't afford it. But God, would you help me get a car? Give me something. And I've learned now not to pigeonhole the way that God. Because if I do that, and every single time that I do that, I'd be disappointed because he never works out the way that I think that he should work out. So I just pray, and I go, God, will you just do something? Will you? Will you I need a car. And the next thing you know, somebody handed me keys. And I go, and I'm looking at the keys going, I can't believe it. You really did do that. 
Every single moment that you have a divine interruption, it's never the way that you think it's going to be. And every single time it happens, you will be caught with your mouth open going, uh, what, what? Which is exactly what the shepherds did. They were filled with fear. And I love what the angel said. Fear not. Whatever you're filled with, the angel says, don't fear. For behold, I bring you. Turn your neighbor and say, that means you. God is talking to you today. And saying that I'm bringing you good news. This is an introduction of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it came not to people that were wise, not to people that were worthy. It came to shepherds. It came to people in the ordinary field. It came to the blue-collar workers, the people working at the mall. It came to people that were, 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 were working at gas stations and car washes. I bring you good news of great joy. There's joy coming your way. And he interrupts your mundane, boring moment with grace that is so wonderful. That unto you this day, verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior. The birth announcement didn't come just to the wise men, just to the king, just to anybody else, but it came to ordinary, normal people. Grace is for you and I. And when you're having a problem connecting truth with your reality, look no further than grace. Seek grace out and embrace grace. Hold on to grace. That's the only thing that will be able to bridge what you know about the truth and the reality of your situation in the moment. It's grace. And in that, you will find truth. Truth and grace cannot be separated. For unto you born in this day in the city of David is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, baby in swaddling clothes, that's not out of the ordinary. But you put that same baby in a manger, that's way out of the ordinary. It's almost like, well, you're going to find a baby. That's like saying, okay, go over there to the nursery over at Sunrise Hospital and look for a baby. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. How do I know? Like, which one? Well, it's going to be in a manger. What? It's always different. Grace is different. Stop looking for God in the normal places that you would think that he would move and expect him to move supernaturally. And he will always, always exceed your expectation every single time. And suddenly, after they said this, you'll find a baby in a manger with some swaddling cloths. There was an angel, a multitude of them. Of the heavenly host praising God. It's almost like a chorus line just showed up. And all of a sudden they were transported into Broadway. And a bunch of people were singing in the background. And they sang, verse 14, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing. Go, turn your neighbor and, go, and say it. Tell them. Go see the thing. Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Can I just tell you, and that's the difference between you experiencing God and you not experiencing God, is that you would, go, you would not dare to go and see the thing. You have to have a fortitude and a hunger to go see the thing. Sometimes you just don't want to go see the thing. Because you're so enamored by your pain and you want to own your pain and you look for other people to own your pain with you when you should actually go and see the thing that has happened to you. Go look for the grace that has happened to you. For unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. It's not just for people with status. It's for everybody. But you will never ever find it unless you go see the thing. Turn to your neighbor and say, go see the thing. The man is yelling, go see the thing already. Let's go see this thing. And I think that's the beauty of what we do on a Sunday morning. I want to go see the thing. I'm in some stuff right now. But Grace, if you're available, and I know that you are because that man keeps yelling that you are. I want to see the thing. And guess what? You will. And they went with haste. They didn't sit around and go, you know what? It's kind of cold outside. Let's wait. 
Let's wait for the right situation. Let's wait when everything is optimum and everything is perfect. Then I will go and see the thing. No, 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 no. Once you know the thing, you just go see the thing already. And you move with haste. Be urgent. Stop wasting time doing the things that you already know how they work. You want the supernatural of God? Go seek out God. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. In other words, they told Mary and Joseph that, hey, guess what? We ran into angels. And Mary told them, hey, an angel visited me too. And then Joseph said, yeah, and an angel visited me while I was dreaming in my sleep. And they corroborated, and they were all part of this story of what wooden God was doing in all of their lives. And then the wise men show up, and they're all having, this is what you call bearing witness, my friend. And having it confirmed by two or three people. God just told me. He told me the same thing. This kid's going to be special. I know, because the angel told me. Well, he told me too. And they came and they worshiped. This is what you and I get to experience every single week. I don't know about you, but that gets me through. And that bridges truth into my reality. That helps me connect the dots between what I don't see God in God and when I see him. I see him a lot more clearly when, some, when, when I don't worry about my own stuff and I focus on God. And when I focus on God, God sends me people that are working in in their lives as well. And I sit there and I go, I'm not weary anymore. I'm not tired anymore. I'm not borderline depressed anymore. I'm not frustrated anymore. Because I see God working in these people, which means he's got to be working in my life too. Because he brought me these people that are so full of life that can see the Savior. Somebody say amen if you believe that. I'm going to give you a, a... a couple things to write down here just, just so that uh, um, you have some homework to do. It's uh, four get-tos. I'm not going to put it up on the screen because I just thought of it this morning. <laughs> write down four get-tos. You get to do this. You don't have to do this. My God is not a God of obligation. You get to worship him. That's the beauty of grace. And when you seek him with all of your heart, the Bible promises that you will find him. So I don't know about you, but I want to find him. So here's four get-tos. Number one is you get an invitation. You get an invitation. Stop and think about it. The wise men got their invitation. Herod kind of knew about the invitation. He was invited, but. He got it. He he was aware of it. Mary and Joseph got their invitation. Now here, shepherds get an invitation. There's no social class that is not not represented. Everybody gets an invitation. You get to have an invitation to the banquet. And I encourage you to go seek him out. Second thing is you get a promise. It's up to you to embrace the promises of God. The Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen. So every time you see a promise, hold on to that bad boy because you can catch that thing and it works. They're not going to turn you away and go, oh, you know, it's an out-of-state check. It's from Bethlehem. Sorry, we don't accept that. It's from Nazareth? No, we don't accept that bank here. No, no, no. You could take this to the bank. Every single time God promises something, it's yes and amen. Third thing is you get a picture. You know, and this is just me being transparent. Whenever God speaks to me, it's nudges, it's direction, and it's picture. I'll see something. If you read the book of Jeremiah, that's usually how he spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, what do you see is what he said. God will give you a picture. And when you get a picture, you have, you have a target now to run after. Sometimes the picture 
is you sitting in your living room with a happy family, all laughing and playing card games and doing something. That's a picture, and that's a target. Let, let what he's given you as a picture become the target of where you pursue him. Because when you do that, you're pursuing the things of God because he's gifted you a picture. I picture my wife and a date night, and I'm going to go do that thing. I'm going to go see to that thing so that it happens. Somebody say amen. amen. You get a picture. Well, I ain't got no picture. Stop, pause, and focus on your God. Focus on the grace, and you will get a picture. The shepherd's got a picture. Unto you, born on this day, is Christ, the Savior. And when you find him, he will be in swaddling cloths in a manger. They got a picture. That's a weird picture, but it was a picture. And when they went and pursued the picture, the picture was confirmed. You get a picture. What's your picture? What do you see? What are you going after? Hopefully it's not something you saw as on social media. Don't pursue those things. Usually it's a picture that you will find when you spend time in solitude with you embracing the presence of God. Those are the kind of pictures that I want. I don't care what everybody else gets. I want my picture of God. What are you showing me? You get a picture. And last but not least, you get to go. You get to go. You don't have to go. You get to go. Unto you, born on this day in the city of David, is the Savior. The Christ is coming. You'll find him. He's a, he's a, he'll be in a ba- he's going to be a baby in a swatting closet, and you'll find him in a manger. Picture. Now, the shepherds could have sat there and go, you know what? That's cool. I like that picture. Picture's good enough for me. And not do anything about it. But the Bible says that they went in haste. And they talked to each other and said, let's go see this thing that has happened. They took advantage of their opportunity to go and they actually went. How long are you going to keep letting the things of God sit on a shelf so that you could just stare at them and go, yeah, it'd be nice to do that someday. It'd be nice to experience that kind of thing one of these days. Well, I feel challenged reading Luke chapter 2 and seeing that they made out and they went in haste to go see this thing that has happened. When God gives you a word, you get to go. 100% of the time, you will never find what you do not look for. If you're not out there looking for it, you will never find it. A hundred percent of the time, you will never find what you don't look for. And you keep wondering, well, I just wish God would show up on my life. I, in the meantime, I'm just going to keep going to church. I hear the guy, but I don't ever do what he says. I read the word, but I don't know about that. I don't know if it's for me. Man, go see the thing that's happening. And go in haste. And God will meet you. Somebody say amen. I want to I close right here. I want to land right here. I've given you stuff to kind of go after and, 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 and a target. And I've given you something to pursue. I want to seal it with prayer and with worship. So that you would feel bold and confident. To pursue something new. Look, you could talk to the people that have been following Jesus for 50 years or so. And you will come to know that it's not the same thing every day for them. It's not because they kept the same routine for 50 years while they experienced God. They sought God out in everything. You could be aware of what God is doing in the presence of crying children. In the presence of changing a dirty diaper, not this guy, but somebody is going to experience God doing that. But you will always find the supernatural available in the ordinary. And God never skimps on his truth. Will you stand with me, church?